do so. Your word says that for the joy that was set upon you, you endured the cross. That you experienced all that you did experience because of your great love for us. And, and again, there's no way we could ever repay you. And I know for me, part of that is just offering out my voice to you. Whether it be in song, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in a message, it's offering a voice to you. Because as the song Gratitude says, that's all that I have a lot of times that I can offer a king is to sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I pray that today as we kind of come off of our Easter high, as we've gone through Good Friday service and Easter service and, and then kind of go into the days after kind of with the Easter hangover from ham and everything else that we have, I pray today that you will help us to see the importance of not just allowing things to stop after Easter Sunday because there's much more that happens after that. So guide and direct our time here, the rest of our time today, Lord, and we just thank you for everything that you do and we honor you with our lives. As we've been studying in our men's group, we heard that we've heard the people that have played the parts of the disciples many times say, I became a slave to Jesus. May we be servants and slaves to Jesus in our day that we would make you known by the way that we know you. We give you praise. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Bob's going to come and share scripture with us. Good morning. Beautiful praise. Good singing this morning. And Pastor Ken is preaching this morning from chapter 15 of the book of Romans. This, uh, this chapter is entitled The Resurrection of Christ. So we're reading, beginning at verse 12, but I want to commend the first 11 verses of chapter 15 for you to read today on your own. So remember how the Apostle Paul tells us how the risen Christ, the risen Christ was his personal gospel study tutor. Um, you remember the story well, uh, 1 Corinthians. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 15. Anyway, he would have to change his whole sermon. Well, we can't have that. But anyway, Saul got his name changed from Saul to Paul. And one letter uh, was a big change on that Emmaus road. And uh, so Jesus taught Paul. That, that was definitely a life-changing Bible study. And Pastor Ken was mentioning our men's Bible study. We're having these personal talks by the apostles and like Philip last week. And uh, wouldn't it be great if Jesus himself was to come and tell us exactly what his most important teaching, his most important teachings were. But here Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, testifies that his change of mind was due to the grace of God, and it inspired him to work harder than even the rest of the apostles to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, that, was, that was Paul's task. And uh, his gift was in preaching the gospel. So Pastor Paul is answering uh, some at Corinth who were saying there is no resurrection of the dead. He wrote this letter 
in response to some questions and difficulties these churches were having. So he, as we read this, listen for the seven times he uses the verb form in this passage expressing the certainty of Christ's bodily resurrection. Um, but one verse from verse 3 here, it just hit me that what Paul was talking about here. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul says that is of first importance. The resurrection of the dead. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. We thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. And Lord Jesus, bless our time together this morning and teach us with your spirit. Put it in our heart, your word for us today, Lord Jesus. Amen. There are sometimes I get up here and I don't have even one piece of paper that I preach from, but, and then there are other times that I have, like, a whole bunch of pieces of paper. Um, so hopefully this doesn't go real long. But I did want to really spend some time today, because it's, it's kind of hit me this past week that my experience in the church as a pastor and even as a, a young person in the church that uh, when it comes to Easter time it seems like spring starts to come and we, and we really start setting our mind and our attention on Easter and we're really pressing toward Easter and Easter is a, a, an awesome time in, in the history of Christianity and, and as even this scripture talks about it there had been no resurrection then we are really following false gods ourselves but we do believe in the resurrection but we really spend a lot of time gearing up for uh, we have Ash Wednesday and and then even like a lot of the Catholics they don't eat meat uh, all through the 40 days of Lent up until um, Easter itself and and so we have Friday night fish fries and all of that kind of stuff, and even more so during Lent because people have given up meat for that time. And, and um, so we gear up to that. We put ashes on our head, and, and we walk through, and then Good Friday we come, and, and we try to really grasp, even my struggle always is, do, are we celebrating, or, or should we be sad and somber? And, and trying to figure all of that out because this Jesus that that we serve is uh, going to die and give his life 
for us and and then we come on Sunday morning and we do the hallelujah Christ is risen hallelujah Christ is risen indeed and then we walk out on Sunday we have our Easter dinners and and maybe pass out Easter baskets to our kids and grandkids and and then it's on we're looking toward Mother's Day and and Father's Day and and we just kind of drop it after that and um, so as I thought about that, I'm like, we, we just really need to spend a little bit of time just talking about continuing to have that same excitement and enthusiasm after Easter. Jesus didn't die and stay in the grave. He rose on the third day. That's exciting. He's still alive. We sing the song, we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know as though know that he is risen. Um, what's the next word? Shall we help me? Whatever men may say. There we go. Um, because people do say that the resurrection didn't happen. There are many things that people talk about that say that it never took place. So I want us to spend a little bit of time looking at the 40 days following Easter and then 10 days after that. Do you know what happened 10 days, the 40 days and then 10 days after? So Jesus was here for 40 days. After 40 days, he left. And he promised what? The Holy Spirit would come. Ten days later is Pentecost. So it's 50 days following Jesus' death on the cross that Pentecost took place. And a lot of times we'll get, on, we'll get to Pentecost Sunday, we'll do a message on Pentecost Sunday and how the Holy Spirit came upon him, but we kind of miss the 40 days leading up to that even in the, the, the 10 days after. So we spent many, many weeks, and I know even my Easter message dealt with some of the, the statements that were made after uh, the resurrection. And we talked about him showing himself to who first? Mary. He came, Mary came looking for him. She wasn't there. She went back and got Peter and John, and Peter and John ran back, and they looked in, and they didn't see him, and they're like, well, he's, he's gone. You know, a typical guy, he's gone. We're going to go back. And we talked about the Mary staying around, and she then sees this angel and begins to have conversations, and in the process of that, it is Jesus himself, and he tells her to go back and... He, so his words are, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? What are you looking for? And then she says, well, they took my Jesus away. He's gone. And he says, don't be afraid. I've been watching Through the Chosen, and I'm on season two. And, and the one that I was watching last night was when uh, the Romans came and took Jesus back for questioning. So the disciples, they're all sitting around their camp, or he's actually, Jesus was teaching them at the time, and the Romans showed up, and they're like, we need to take you in for questioning. We need to take you. And, and, and he responded, fine, or, you know, okay, I'm, I'm willing to go. He said, well, are you going to fight us? No, we're not going to fight you. Your disciples have weapons. Yes, a couple of them do. Okay, I'm going to ask you to have your disciples drop their weapons and stand back. And, and so they drop their weapons and they step back and the Romans take their, their weapons and then they take Jesus and leave. But Jesus looks at them and says, I need you to stay here and keep planning what we're planning. Because what he's doing at this time, he's standing around sharing, I, I'm going to share a message. And I'm preparing to share this message. And we need to be really prepared. And I need you guys to help me with that. So they're going to take me away, but it's okay. And he says, don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid. I'll be back. And what did they do? And, but, and he told them, keep working on what we were working on. And they took him away. Well, all of a sudden, they're like freaking out. They're, they're getting upset. They start to argue with each other. Some of them want to go after him. Some of them are saying, no, he told us to stay here. He told us to, to keep doing what we're doing. And, and two of them did end up running off and, and following. And, and, but, but he made the statement, don't be afraid. I'll be back. And he said, keep going with my business. And I think so many times we struggle because we get to difficult times and we're afraid. And even though it's okay to be afraid, Jesus says, it's okay. It's all right. I'm coming back. I'll be back. So as we think there... If, if you go into Google and you Google the seven uh, statements from the cross, you'll see tons of stuff come up on the Internet for books that have been written and everything else about sayings from the cross. But when you start to look for sayings that were said after the resurrection, you don't hardly see anything. You don't really see anything that's posted because of that. And I think, again, it goes back to the fact that as glorious as Easter is, we kind of get used to, like, we have these celebration moments. And, and so even in our lives, we celebrate, and then we go back to the normal. And then we celebrate, and we go back to the normal. Whether it's birthday parties or graduation parties. And I, I, I found out, my, my brother lives in North Carolina. They don't have graduation parties after graduation there like, wow, that's weird. I've always known that we have graduation parties when kids graduate. But so we have these parties. We celebrate, and then afterwards it's done. You know, so last week we got together for Easter. Bonnie's birthday was the day before Easter, and we celebrated all of that. And the kids brought gifts and all of that. And, and then Monday it was back to the old grind and back to the normal. And, and everything just went back to normal. And I think that happens with us when it comes to even Easter. We live like God, like Jesus rose on Sunday. But on Monday, we start to forget already that he did. So if I don't accomplish anything else here today, I want you to be at the place where you live the same way the day after Easter as you did the day of Easter that you are rejoicing, that you serve a risen Savior, that you are seeking to connect with Him whenever you can, that you're doing all you can do to know Him more. I, you, you hear me say this all the time. We have to know Him more so we can make Him known. And how do we know Him more? So we have to spend more time with Him. We have to learn to understand Him better. The disciples hung around with Jesus for three years and they still didn't know everything. I think there are some times that we read the Word of God and we read it through once and we're like, well, I know all I need to know. It, it'll get me through. It'll get me through till Jesus comes. And that's not what God desires. That's not what He expects. He wants us to spend time with Him whenever we can. And even it's Scripture that says that we're to pray continually, that we're to have such a relationship with Him that He is with us always. And if we really lived our lives that way, don't you think it would change the way that we speak to people sometimes? Don't you think that it would change the way that we um, speak about people behind their backs sometimes? Don't you think some of that would change if we truly were living with the heart of Jesus? And yet we struggle with that because we celebrate the resurrection and then we put it all away. That's why I typically leave the white cloth up for the, rest of the, for the rest of the year now because I want us to continually, not only the royal purple, but the white that 
signifies his death and resurrection because we need to remember it all the time. So I'm just going to go through real quickly the, the sayings, and then we're going to kind of go back and, and talk about them a little bit. Um, we had talked about the road to Emmaus, and Jesus walked up on Cleophas and the other disciple that we don't know. We've never been given a name. And he says the words, what are you so concerned about? Or I talked about last week, why are your faces all wrenched? You ever walk up to somebody and you know that they're concerned? You know that they're struggling with something because their faces are just kind of wrenched and clenched? That's how they were. And he walked up and said, what are you so concerned about? And as we talked about last week, he spent the rest of the trip telling them, repeating what Jesus had said beforehand. I'm going to leave for a while. I'm going to have to die, but I'm, I'm going to come back. I'm not going to leave you. And yet even when they saw the tomb was empty, they still struggled to put it together in their minds that he's going to come back. So the fourth post-resurrection saying is, Peace be with you. Remember, he went and saw Cleophas. He talked with Cleophas. When he had finished, he disappeared right from their sight. Like it was not, he walked out of the house. He disappeared at that moment. Cleophas and the other disciple ran back. They find the disciples, and guess who shows up? Jesus shows up with them, and he tells them, Peace be with you. Thomas wasn't with them at the time. And we're going to talk about, at the end of this, the different places that we find ourselves in because I think each one of these disciples found themselves in a different place spiritually. <coughs> the fifth saying to them was when he gave them the Great Commission that you find in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Do we know what that is? Where he says, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all the things that I have taught you. And I'm going to paraphrase here. And then he says, Oh, and by the way, I will always be with you. And yet they still struggled to know that he would be with them. After he sees them, Peter decides to go back to what he's accustomed to. Remember, these guys have been following this leader around for three years. They left their jobs. They left everything. And they then... Went, he, Peter went back to what he was doing. And what was Peter? He was a fisherman. So he went back to fishing. And Jesus goes and finds him and talks with him. And he walks up and says, actually there was Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel and the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder, fishing. Jesus walks up and says, have you caught anything? Killian was telling me today that he did some fishing the other day, and I said, did you catch anything? He's like, no, I didn't catch anything. So I'm going to do more. But Jesus was kill still concerned with them at that point if they had caught anything. And then the seventh word that he shared with them is, wait for the gift. So the last time he saw them, he said, wait for the gift. It also tells us that he gave them authority over all things. That they were then able to do all the things that he had been able to do. Remember, this took place 40 days over a period of time of 40 days. 
I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible sometimes, I have the habit of lumping everything together. So like Jesus died on the cross on, on Friday, he rose on Sunday, Sunday night he saw everybody, and then he was gone. But that's not the way it happened. It was over a period of 40 days that he allowed himself to be seen at different points in time. Remember, 40 days followed, Jesus descended, or ascended, and then 10 days of waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend on them. So we truly are still in the Easter season. It didn't stop on Sunday. Seven weeks and one day after the crucifixion. Yeah, I'm, I'm fanning through them quickly for you. So again, just to just to recap before I move into the last part of it, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. We find that in Matthew 28, 1 through 8, Mark 16, 1 through 8, Luke 24, 1 through 12, John 20, 1 through 18. And I give you those scriptures, and I know you can't write them down, or, but in the four Gospels are four different stories. So you heard that some of it was in one Gospel, some in another but not all of it in everyone. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Second, Poe's resurrection saying was, Greetings, do not be afraid. Again, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, he appeared to Mary Magdalene in Matthew 28, 8 through 10. Jesus appears to both Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Mark 16, 9 through 11, he appears only to Mary Magdalene. So I'm kind of building us up to a place to get us to understand why some people are questioning whether this happened. The third saying was, why are you so concerned? Luke 24, 13 through 24 says that they go back and tell the 11. That's the only book of the Bible. That's the only gospel that says anything about them going back. It's really the only book of the Bible that has anything about them even seeing him. The others don't. Do we know why? Logically, for a minute, why would that have been? Do you remember who Luke was? Dr. Luke, was he one of the disciples? No, he was not one of the disciples. Was he walking around with Jesus during the time of his ministry? No. Luke was a doctor. He came along after the fact. He came to know the Lord through Paul. And then he went back to all of these people and got the account. So when you look at Luke, Luke is Luke, him telling the story of him going back and talking to all the disciples and getting their sides of the story. The disciples, how many of the four Gospels were disciples? Do we know? Two. Which one? Matthew and John. Mark was not with them at the beginning. He was not one of the disciples. Was he one of the apostles? Yes. Did Luke become what they would consider one of the apostles? Yes. And you say, well, what's the difference between disciples and apostles? Do we know? Disciples were taught. They were learners. They were somebody that walked along with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and were, uh, were taught by them. <coughs> what was an apostle? 
teacher, actually somewhat similar because an apostle was supposed to be somebody that still was with that person through part of their life. That's why a lot of people question whether Paul is an apostle. They question because Paul is called an apostle. But Paul didn't walk with Jesus. Paul didn't come on the scene until after Jesus was crucified. It's about 40 years after. So why was he an apostle? We learned in our men's Bible study in the book of Acts, after Paul had his Damascus Road experience, and after he got his sight, he went away for two years, it says. And he spent time with God. It's believed that he actually was spending time with Jesus, allowing him to teach him everything that he needed to go to know to be able to go on and do the ministry that he did. So that's why he's considered an apostle, because he did spend two years with the Lord. Sorry, I'm getting off off track, but... Fourth, fourth resurrection saying, Peace be with you. He appeared to the eleven plus Thomas in Luke 24. The eleven are mentioned as a group. Why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? And look at my hands and my feet. Touch me. In John chapter 20, Thomas is not there when Jesus appeared to the eleven earlier. So the disciples were all claiming to have seen the risen Lord doubting Thomas was not there. But then he was the one that did ask in one of the Gospels, how do I know it's you? And Jesus says, put your fingers in my hand and my side and you'll know. The fifth, he appeared to the eleven, obeyed and went to Galilee and they received the great commission in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the most famous account has no mention of the Holy Spirit. It just says, go into the world and make disciples. But he does say, I will always be with you. In Mark 16, no direct mention of the Holy Spirit. But signs were promised. The ability to cast out demons. All the authority that I have, I give to you to be able to heal people. To cast out demons for you to do. Still never mentions the Holy Spirit. But in Luke 24, it says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. In John 20, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And the Holy Spirit was breathed into them by Jesus. And in John 21, the Great Commission shown by Peter's reinstatement. Remember exchange Peter do you love me yes I love you feed my sheep and turns right around but Peter do you love me Lord you know I do then feed my sheep and a third time if you remember we talked about that quite a while back and each time that he's making that statement he's using a different form of the word love he's do you phileo me do you um, then to the end, do you agape me? So he's speaking with him. But again, Peter was shamed when he denied Christ. That's why he went back to fishing. He's like, I'm not worthy to even be your disciple. Because I told you I would follow you wherever you go. And then at the time they take you away and I'm asked, I'm like, hey, I, I don't know him. And it happened three times. When it talks about, have you caught any fish? We only see that in John 21. And they kind of reminisce the first calling when he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then wait for the gift, the seventh word. He appeared to the eleven in Jerusalem, Luke 24. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. And 
and in Acts 1, 1 through 7, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Those are the post-resurrection sayings. But when you, dis- you, when you really investigate these sayings, as I talked about before, we find that they're not always listed in every one of the Gospels. And that's why people have begun to question, did the resurrection really happen? Did the disciples just come and take him in the middle of the and hide him somewhere? Did somebody else come and take him, take him away? Did the Romans even take him away? There are some that say the Romans took him away. So how do we know it's true? How do we know it's true? I don't know if you've ever sat on a jury before in a court case. But as a jury, you're supposed to sit there and you're supposed to listen to the testimony and the best you can take whatever um, proof that is shown and make a decision on whether somebody's guilty or not guilty. I don't know about you, but I've had opportunity at times where, you know, people and their relationships get a little messed up and it's like setting down to talk with them. And you talk to one and this is their story. And you talk to another and this is their story. And as a counselor, I've come to believe that those are both extremes of the story. And if you bring them back to the middle somewhere, this, you find the truth in the story. Has that been your experience? I mean, we tend to kind of pad our own story, right? So there are those that, that look at the resurrection and they struggle to know whether it's true or not true. So some of the reasons that people struggle with it. Number one, they struggled with it to begin with because it was women that gave the news. Because women were not looked at as anyone that had any truth to speak at all. So they're like, well, it's women that told the story. It can't be true. It wasn't men that told it. On the other side of that, if you look in the scriptures, you know that it has to be true. Because the disciples knew that too. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John knew that, man, if we put that women brought this message, if they were really trying to change it, they're like, we, we can't have women telling it because people aren't going to believe it. We find in scriptures that there's incredible cohesion across centuries with dozens of writers. That normally don't happen. You and I could sit here and we could look outside right now and each one of us would have a different story of how we say it looks outside. We couldn't even be cohesive in that. And yet writers have had a cohesiveness. The reality of the death and the crucifixion can't be argued. There are historical facts, historical writing that talk about this man Jesus that was crucified. So there's no question about that. It's the resurrection. There's a belief that they collaborated and, and that there was conspiracy, that the, the four gospel writers sat down and said, okay, let's write this and everybody write the same thing. Who would have believed that? 
Have you ever had somebody come and tell you a story and you know that the person that you were asking them about, that they had sat down and wrote that story together? Or even like your kids. Have you ever had your kids that did something wrong and you could tell as soon as they started telling you that they had got together beforehand to figure out a story? Okay, this is the story we're going to tell mom and dad. This is what it's going to be. So you say this and this and this. And you say, I'm going to say this and this and this. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're, they're going to believe our story because it all lines up. Well, you imagine what would have happened if the disciples would have actually sat down and wrote all the same story? It would have actually been less believable than more believable. They gave their story from the way that they saw it. They wrote their story from the way that they remembered it. And remember, Matthew was a tax collector. What I'm seeing as they depict him in the Chosen series, that, that he was very mathematical and he... I think he actually, by the way it looks, they're, they're making it almost look like there is some autistic parts to him, which made him very detail-oriented. It made him very much, and if you remember watching, I mean, he's always writing, and he's always... So Matthew's account is, is bigger because he wrote a lot of things down, but he also stopped it right at the crucifixion. He didn't write much after that. So the fact that they even had different personal story for me makes it more believable because they had their own personal story. My goodness. Time has flown. How can I wrap this up quickly? I know, it's been a long morning, hasn't it? All right. So let's just think of, right, just real quickly, let's think of Mary, Cleopas, um, the disciples, or Thomas, and Peter. So you got Mary's experience. Mary's prior to encountering the resurrection, she's moving toward the tomb. So Mary's moving toward. Cleopas is doing what? He's moving away. He's going away from. He's, he's trying to figure out what's going away, and he didn't stay around. He's going away. Peter's encounter with the resurrection, resurrected Christ, um, he went back to fishing. He went back to what he knew. I mean, if I died last night and the following day, this morning, showed up here to preach, you'd be kind of freaked out, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd be a, a tad freaky. So here's Peter. Jesus dies. And then the next day, a couple days later, he's talking to him. And we find that Peter wasn't even really phased by it. He just went back to fishing. It's like, huh. Jesus kind of came around. And then you have Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas. He's not moving at all. So you have Mary coming. You have Cleophas going. You have Peter unfazed at all, and then you have Thomas that doesn't move. Look, I'm not going anywhere until I know what's going on. It's almost as if Peter had just given up. He's like, okay, he's dead. I give up. So maybe you. There are times when you need comfort or you're sharing tears over your sin or broken relationships or tears over circumstances beyond your control. 
See, she was sharing tears. Where is he? And Jesus came and wiped away her tears. He wants to wipe your tears away. For times like Cleophas and his friends, we, we had our list of questions when Christ appeared and he explained the scriptures to us. And, and if you remember in that scripture, it says after, after they, everything had happened, they said, you know, when he was speaking, there was a burning in our heart that was taking place. There was an excitement or a vision. Jesus appeared in the midst of our questions and yet, that was the catalyst for all of our future hopes and dreams. There have been times in my life where I just have all these questions that just doesn't make sense. And yet, there comes a point where my heart burns because God makes it clear why it happens. He wants to do that for you. Or how about times with Tom, like Thomas? Are you a doubter? Do you have doubts? You sometimes wonder if I really am who I should be, if any doubts. You kind of get to the point where you're, you get stubborn and you just say, I'm not moving, I'm not doing anything, I'm just staying here. Jesus appeared miraculously in many of their lives. And he wants to do that for us too. He wants to provide for us. He wants to heal us. He performed miracles in my life when I didn't think it was possible. And then you have Peter, ready to throw in the towel. Even in the church, have you ever had times where it's like, I'm just ready to throw in the towel? I've been there. I understand it. I know. I got to the point where, and with, along with my wife, you know, when you have your wife look at you and say, Ken, I can't do this anymore. It's either me or the church. At that point, it kind of makes you take up and wonder. It's like, you know what? I'm just throwing in the towel. Can't do it anymore. I love people, and at the same time, people hurt. <laughs> Relationships hurt. Yet God doesn't want it to be that way. He wants to come to us in our times of hurting. think about these four situations, these four different people in scriptures. We live in a, a world today where living as a Christian is not popular. There's a form of it being popular. I mean, the movie stars and some of that try to make it sound popular because they'll get up and they'll say, oh, I give all thanks to God and all glory to God. And I'm not saying that all of them don't mean that. But yet, their lives are not always necessarily lining up with that. There is what we call in our world today a progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity is trying to take really all of the negative out of Christianity and just do the positive. So it becomes more a power of positive thinking and, and wrapping God in that a little bit and and everything's going to be okay. But that's not the answer. You can't take Jesus out of it. You have to leave him in the midst of it. Because he is the answer. He is, as the scripture says, the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way we get to him is through the Father. And if you don't know the Father, you don't know Him. And if you don't know Him, you don't know the Father. We need
we can begin to live our lives in a way that we know him and that we're emulating his characteristics so that we treat each other with respect and with love and compassion even when we don't deserve it because you know what I didn't deserve Jesus I was a mess as a teenager I was a hot mess and yet he came calling to me I didn't go looking for him he came looking for me I was the one in the 99 and I have a feeling that you were the one in the 99 that he came looking for let's serve him with everything that we are let's become slaves to Jesus let's allow the fruit of the spirit to be so evident in our lives that people can't look at the church and say I don't want to have anything to do with that place they just fight all the time We want them to come saying, wow, those people love Jesus, and they love me. It doesn't matter what I've done, they still love me. That's what we want to see, because that's what he was to his disciples. They didn't deserve him. They were, they were a messed up, motley crew. They were... <laughs> changed the world not because they were smart great influential men and women but because they were tied to the father and allowed him to flow through them and had a passion to make him known father we love you today we thank you for your great love for us we thank you that Easter did not stop on Easter Sunday that you continued to show yourself. You knew that you, if you only appeared to one person that they would never believe that you had risen. So you spent 40 days making sure that you were seen by many and that nobody could collaborate to make up the stories. You showed up to Mary you showed up to Cleopas and the disciple. You showed up to the eleven. There was a point, excuse me, there was a point where you stood before 500 people. There's no question that you rose from the grave and that you accomplished what you set out to accomplish. And we can have full confidence and faith to live our lives in a way that represents you. Touch your people, Lord. Help them to forgive me today for keeping us over so long. But Lord, we just want to offer it to you and give you glory. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.